gracious good day to one and all once again, tis I, Norton the First, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico, back with you all once again for episode number 128 of Emperor Norton's Fantastic History Vlog. Today is August 28, 2020. It is our 164th day <clears throat> under COVID-19 restrictions. If I sound a little hoarse today, it's because it is extremely smoky right now in San Francisco. We have fires burning all around us and a lot of the smoke is hitting here very heavily today. Uh, we thought it was fog this morning, but it appears to be a combination of that and smoke, uh, mostly smoke. We are under purple air conditions today. I did not know until last year that such a thing existed. It's about as bad as it was last year, and this will probably be going on for a number of years now, uh, to come rather, <clears throat> because of climate change, which we're not addressing. And we are very sorry that we did not vacuum or break our forests, but uh, what can I say? We're horrible people, we're negligent, and that's why things like that happen here. We want them to happen, apparently. Don't get me started. Let's begin with our national days. <clears throat> Today is National Bowtie Day, and I know nobody who rocks a bow tie better than our friend, a true friend of the Empire, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Hope you're wearing your bow tie today. Race Your Mouse Around the Icons Day. Okay, I tried looking this one up and really couldn't find the origins of it or really what it's supposed to be, so, but there you go. It is Radio Commercials Day, so if you like radio commercials, does anyone? Anyway, it's a day for that, but here's one people can get behind, Red Wine Day, you betcha. For our Florida Man story today, uh, Florida Man once caught mowing lawn naked, wants his teaching job back. So for our San Francisco story today, we're gonna to jump ahead a day. We're not using John Walston's book today. Uh, the reason being, of course, we don't do the program over the weekend. Well, we do with the Countess on Saturday and programming note for this week, the normal, normal uh, Saturday show. Uh, we'll be moving to Sunday this week because, well, we are doing our first walking tour since March 12th. Wish us luck. It's a charter for someone's birthday, and uh, we'll see how it goes between the restrictions and the smoke. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, tomorrow is Chop Suey Day, and uh, this is a dish that was allegedly invented here in San Francisco. And so for today's segment, we're going to read from a book that we have been working on uh, called Created in California, The Golden State's Gifts to Gastronomy, about 49 dishes and drinks invented in California. And this is the one about chop suey. For many, chop suey was their introduction to Chinese cuisine. This ubiquitous dish, usually consisting of, but not limited to, Bean sprouts, meat, celery, onions, and bamboo shoots walk fried in a soy-based sauce is all America knew of Chinese food for decades. A chop suey craze, craze swept America in the early 1900s, and the colorful yet deteriorating neon signs found in many Chinatowns today owe their creation to that craze. Numerous stories abound for the creation of chop suey nearly as many as there are variations on the dish. Although it has its origins in China's Guangdong province, as a dish named Tsap Sui, or Shap Sui, meaning miscellaneous leftovers, mixed pieces, or odds and ends, this Cantonese dish would find its ultimate popularity in the 1900s, uh, but getting its start in the 1800s. Some credit its origin to chefs working for Chinese laborers building the Transcontinental Railroad, while others say it was created to honor a U.S. visit by Qing Dynasty Premier Li Hong Zhang in 1896. That story appears to be invalid, as many written references to the dish can be found in the 1880s. The most popular story 
has its origins in San Francisco during the 1850s or 1860s when a group of drunken sailors or miners entered uh, the Macau and Wusong restaurant after closing and demanded to be fed. This was in San Francisco. There was little left in the pantry, so the harried chef, afraid he'd be beaten if he didn't serve his hungry patrons, chopped up whatever was left in the kitchen, stir-fried it with some soy sauce, and served it to his impatient guests. The next day, they returned and asked for more of the chef's concoction, and it caught on. Now, I think we've pointed this out before. That is a thread that runs through numerous food stories where something is created out of desperation. The people like it so much, they come back the next day and say, please make us that again. Or someone else sees it and says, ooh, make me one like that. There are lots of stories like that, like the Cobb salad and the French dip sandwich, just to name a couple. With Americans' taste for Chinese food becoming more refined with the introduction of Mandarin, Hunan, and Sichuan cuisines after diplomatic relations with China were reestablished in 1970, many Cantonese favorites, the mainstay Chinese food, Chinese mainstay of Chinese food menus before that time, fell out of favor. Dishes like egg foo young, lobster Cantonese, and more were replaced by kung pao chicken and mushu pork. Through it all. Chop suey remains a favorite and is still on many menus. There are also uh, some places it's origin story in New York, some say Chicago, uh, but I think we can rightfully claim it here in San Francisco, but we usually feel that way about things. Our other histories for today. 1609, English explorer Henry Hudson discovers and explores Delaware Bay. 1830, the first American-built locomotive, Tom Thumb, races a horse-drawn car from Stockton to Stokes Stagecoach Company, from Baltimore to Ellicott Mills. Let history record that due to mechanical problems, the horse won. 1845, Scientific American Magazine publishes for the first time. 1922, WEF in New York City airs its first radio commercial, uh, Queensboro Realty. It was $100 for 10 minutes, which is why it's radio commercial day, apparently. 1937, Toyota Motors becomes an independent company. 1949, a riot prevents Paul Robeson from singing near Peekskill, New York. 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivers his I Have a Dream speech addressing the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, Civil Rights March, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. 1965, the first Subway sandwich shop opens in Bridgeport, Connecticut. 1982, uh, we're gonna, this is going to be a little bit long. Uh, the first gay games are held in San Francisco, and I believe at Keysar Stadium. I'm pretty sure about that. Should have fact check myself. Sorry. Uh, now, they were originally supposed to have been called the Gay Olympics, and they were founded by Dr. Tom Waddell, but the U.S. Uh, Olympic Committee sued. Well, let, let's get into that here. Uh, soon after returning to San Francisco in 1972, Waddell joined a gay Boeing bowling league. It inspired him to consider organizing a gay, a gay sporting event modeled on the Olympics. He followed through with the idea in the early 1980s. The first gay Olympics was to take place in San Francisco that year in the form of a sports competition and arts festival. But a few weeks before the event was to begin, the United States Olympic Committee, USOC, sued Waddell's organization over its use of the word Olympic. Despite the fact the USOC had not previously protested when other groups used the name, like Special Olympics, Animal Olympics, Police Olympics, endless ones. Despite the fact the USOC had not previously protested when other groups had used the name, they alleged that allowing gay Olympics would injure them. They succeeded in securing an injunction just 19 days before the first games were to begin. Nevertheless, the games, now rechristened the Gay Games, went forward. They were a great success, perhaps because they emphasized sportsmanship, personal achievement, and inclusiveness to a far greater degree than the Olympics. 
In 1987, the United States Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision ruled in favor of the USOC. The court affirmed the USOC's right to collect legal fees from Waddell and it placed a lien on his home. In 1987, a few weeks before Waddell died, the USOC waived its legal fees and removed the lien. Now, this all happened when Dr. Tom Waddell was on his deathbed. And this was absolutely special discrimination against LGBTQ people because the USOC never sued any other organization for using the term Olympics and to the best of my knowledge, never has. Terrible. 1994, the first Japanese gay pride parade is held. Our births today, by the way, we need to point out, well, it was, it was pointed out to us that today was Count Leo Tolstoy's birthday, but when we researched it further, uh, it was actually, that was on the old calendar that's no longer used, and that translates to September 9. Sorry, Mark, we got your other one in, but uh, we'll read Tolstoy's on the proper date on the current calendar. Well, let's get on with the rest. Uh, 1749, thank you, Mark, for this one. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, German writer and social philosopher. 1889, actor Charles Boyer. 1917, Jack Kirby, American cartoonist, X-Men, Spider-Man, the Hulk, Captain America. 1930, actor Ben Gazzara, 1943, another actor. David Soule in 1969, another actor. Jason Priestley, Deaths Today. Junipero Serra, founder of the California Missions. Uh, I'm not even gonna go there. Uh, I, will, I refuse to call him saint. He was responsible for a lot of forced conversions and deaths of Native Americans. So he is not one of our heroes, absolutely not. 1903, American writer and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. He designed Central Park. He was actually brought out to design Golden Gate Park. He took a look at the sand dunes and said, uh-uh, and went home. 1955. This is the day that Elm Emmett Till died. Uh, he was an African-American kidnapped and lynched at the age of 14 in Money, Mississippi. His crime, he was alleged to have wolf whistled at a white woman. 1967, the death of actor Paul Muni, the namesake, of course, of our public transit system here in San Francisco. And 1985, well, one of our absolute favorites and who was in a classic San Francisco movie, as well as numerous other movies, Ruth Gordon. She was so wonderful in Harold and Maude, but she had a very long and distinguished career. And now, since we are ending with a quote, we thought we'd bring one back to uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, because the March on Washington today, there's a quote from that speech he gave. Nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscious stupidity. Absolutely. Well, that wraps it up for today's edition. Don't forget, we're not doing a show tomorrow. The Countess and I, we're doing one on Sunday this week because of our tour. Um, also, don't forget, we are accepting tips. Uh, this blog does cost some money to do. We're always trying to upgrade, get better apps and better equipment for make this vlog look better. If you watch some of the very early episodes, you know it's made a difference. Also with our unemployment benefits being cut, uh, it's, it's pretty tight right now. So please leave a tip if you can, we really appreciate it. We appreciate all of our donors immensely. We could not do it without you all. Uh, also, here's more information about our tours, about San Francisco history on all the websites that are linked to sftimemachine.com. So if you want to dig deeper on any stories, that's where you're going to go to find that. Until we see you again, stay safe, stay inside, stay healthy. If you do go outside, please wear a mask. It is just the simplest thing. I mean, nobody really likes it. You know, I don't like wearing a mask. Who does? But you are, present, you are preventing death, misery, um, 
not wearing a mask at this point is supremely selfish. And by the way, wearing it under your nose or on your chin does not count. We went out to do some shopping the other day. We were shocked to see the number of people who were not wearing their masks properly. Please don't kill people. It's that simple. Don't kill people. Also, don't take unproven cures that will probably kill you as well faster than the virus. Rely on the scientists for your information, not your Uncle Henry or a video you saw on YouTube. Go to reputable sources, please. And most of all, be kind to one another. We need a return to civility. Don't forget, September 17 coming up is uh, Empire Day, the day that we declared all ourselves the Emperor of the United States, the 162nd, the beginning of the 162nd year of the Nortonian reign. It's the 161st anniversary of us reading, or actually the proclamation being published in the Bulletin newspaper, September 17, 1859. We are planning a virtual event, event through the Emperor Norton Legacy League. Those of you on Facebook, you will find the event on there, the Emperor Norton Legacy League. It's going to be a virtual event. It's still taking shape. Uh, but we're going to try to make something fun of it, so uh, please, please sign up for that. Love to see a huge turnout. Well, until we see you again, have a gracious good day.